for you to use. Please do not use a flash if you are taking pictures. If you leave before the Q&A is finished, please exit quietly and refrain from talking until you have left the room. A lectures program student walker, worker will be in the hall outside the room to swipe your student IDs if you are here for class credit. Swiping will not start until the lecture is finished. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Beata Schmidtman. Welcome again, and thank you for joining us tonight for the spring, <coughs> excuse me, spring 2023 College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Lecture. Um, as Catherine said, I'm Beata Schmidtmann, Dean of the College, and it's my pleasure to be your host tonight for this special event. This evening's lecture is the 34th in this lecture series, which highlights faculty excellence and achievement in teaching, research, and engagement in the College of Arts and Sciences. Exceptional members of the LES faculty are invited to present lectures from their own diverse areas of scholarly expertise. They are faculty members who solve global challenges, who connect the world with art and culture, and who push the boundaries of educational and intellectual dialogue. Our topics have ranged from the use of stem cells to repair brain tissue to the war in Ukraine to the challenges associated with climate change in Iowa. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to acknowledge the ICU Lectures Program for their role in helping us sponsor and coordinate this event. And I'd also really like to thank everyone from the LES team who was involved in making tonight's lecture possible. This is an important partnership for us and heightens our ability to share the college's contributions with the community and is greatly appreciated. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Amy Andrioli, Roy J. Carver Chair and University Professor in the Department of Biochemistry, Biophysics, and Molecular Biology. Her research and teaching interests broadly focus on structural biology and immune cell signaling. The three stories she will tell tonight illustrate how scientists and physicians are devising new approaches to specific types of cancers. These vignettes will show how serendipity drives discovery how great cancer drugs can be plagued by resistance, and how vaccines and immuno immunotherapies are reshaping cancer treatments of the future. Andreotti's research has focused on the molecular mechanisms that control immune cell signaling with an emphasis on a specific family of immune proteins. This family, called the TEC kinases, are critical for a proper immune response, and one member of the family Bruton's tyrosine kinase, or BTK, is the target of cancer therapies to treat leukemias and lymphomas. LES research truly does transform the world by addressing the challenging issues of our time, and Professor Andreotti is no, reception, no exception. Together with her research group, she has published 63 research articles during her career, and her work has been continuously funded by the National Institutes of Health since 1999. Please join me in welcoming the spring 2023 Dean's Lecturer, Professor Amy Andreotti. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Schmidtman. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and share these stories. Um, I want to start by saying that cancer is difficult to think about. Uh, we all know somebody who has cancer. Many of us have lost family members to cancer. Maybe some of us have cancer. And so it's not often a fun subject, and I'm not going to make it fun. But what I do want to do is share three stories that help us see how um, ongoing efforts in the scientific research and, um, arena are really creating new ways to think about how to treat different cancers. And I think. We're going to span a, a range of time tonight, and I hope that by the end you'll see and agree that there's some really exciting things happening in cancer treatment. We have a long way to go, but I think that we're maybe turning a corner and, and being able to really tackle the many diseases that fall under the umbrella of cancer. Um, let's see. So with that, um, what is cancer? Um, cancer is uh, 
misregulation of cell processes that is caused by DNA damage. So a normal cell has the DNA in the nucleus. This is the blueprint for everything that cell needs to do throughout its, um, and to carry out all of its functions. And then if that DNA gets damaged and not repaired, uh, that can lead to uncontrolled cell growth um, and loss of cellular function and um, proliferation of these cancer cells and all kinds of crazy bad things can happen. Um, we, do, it, we do have ways to repair DNA and through much of our life, DNA damage is occurring and it's getting repaired, but sometimes that damage gets through and, and causes uh, what we call cancer. Um, so what causes DNA damage? These are things you're probably very familiar with. Um, being out in the sun too much, UV radiation, um, smoking cigarettes, the, the public has finally agreed that that's probably not a good idea. Um, the compounds in tobacco smoke will damage your DNA directly. Um, I am gonna mention viral infections later. Some viruses can later in life, um, once that infection's resolved, cause cancer to, to arise. So there's numerous ways that DNA can be damaged and then if it doesn't get repaired, can lead to cancer. So um, this is a poster from 1938 where it says the only weapons against cancer are surgery, x-rays, and radium. Um, and so this is sort of the beginning of our time course tonight, and I'm hoping by the end you'll see that we have a lot more tools now um, to be able to tackle this really biochemical and biological problem. Um, so where are we today? Um, so we've made great progress, but there's no question that we have um, still much to do in this area. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do before I really start talking about uh, the cells and the proteins and the small molecule drugs that we use for cancer is I wanna give you a sense of scale. Um, many of you probably have this in your head, um, but I'm gonna go to this. Um, uh, maybe we won't. It worked when I tested it. Isn't that always the case? Okay. I'll try one more time and then we're not gonna do scale. Okay, so what this is supposed to do is we're gonna, we would zoom in from everyday objects like the coffee bean and the grain of rice um, and then we would get a sense of as we get smaller and smaller, first we get to single cell organisms like amoebas, then we get to the size of our human cells, the human egg cells, the biggest, which I always think is kind of cool. Um, then we get to uh, the intracellular organelles like mitochondria, bacteria, then we get to viruses, so we think a lot about viruses these days. And then smaller than viruses, we get to protein molecules. And then smaller than that yet, we get to small organic molecules. For example, if you took a Tylenol today, that's a small organic molecule drug. Um, so if you want to try this, it's very fun. Just Google Cell Scale Utah, and you'll get to this site when you have internet. I don't know why I don't. Um, and uh, it's, it's fun to sort of zoom in and out. Okay, so that we get to these three stories. Um, the first one, I'm gonna talk about this Cyclops sheep and the meandering path that that took to a cancer treatment. Um, this middle story is more related to the work that my research group does here at Iowa State. Um, and then the last story is really looking at how the immune system is being turned onto um, cancer and used to uh, increase and improve treatment. Okay, so this story started in the 1950s on an Idaho sheep ranch um, where the ranchers were noticing that their baby lambs were being born with this cyclops, um, single eye in the center of the forehead. Um, this was concerning. Their livelihood was having these um, lambs. And so they called in scientists from the U.S. Department of Agriculture who spent nearly a decade to try to figure out what was causing this birth defect. Interestingly, there was nothing wrong with the pregnant ewes. It was only these uh, lambs being born with this really severe birth defect. One of the USDA scientists, Lynn James, actually lived with the sheep for three summers and observed their behavior. Um, and he finally um, was able to recognize that during drought, the pregnant ewes were going to higher ground and eating this corn flower um, or this corn lily. And 
and you can see this publication is 1964, so it took almost 10 years before this group of scientists was able to say, there is something toxic in this flower that when the pregnant mother eats it, it's causing this very dramatic um, birth defect. So um, shortly after that, uh, the chemical compound that was the toxic source of this birth defect was isolated. They named it cyclopamine. I'm using the language here of gen just general organic chemistry uh, to indicate the structure of the compound. You can see it's a rather complex fused ring system. Um, and it's this one small molecule that's causing this dramatic effect on these um, developing lambs. So what does it do? How does it work? So before we get into too much how it works, I want to talk to you a little bit about cell signaling. Um, this is an area that my laboratory thinks about a lot. Um, this is gonna, a movie to illustrate cell signaling. What you can see at the top is um, the pink surface. This is a cross-section of a cell. The pink surface is the outer membrane of the cell. Beneath that in the lighter blue is the inside of the cell with all of the different components. At the very bottom in white is the nucleus. That's the control center. And then the dark blue at the top is the outside of the cell. Our cells don't look nice and smooth like this. They're studded with different types of protein molecules. And these protein molecules serve as receptors for different signals. Um, and so all of our cells have many, many proteins decorating their surface. And different signals are going to impinge on those receptors and cause a cell to respond. So for example, growth factor might come and impinge on a growth factor receptor, and that's gonna send information to the nucleus to tell that cell to grow and divide. So when we watch this movie, I'll try to talk about what's happening during the cell signaling process. So the receptors are studying the outside, the signal is the blue ball, and then a number of chemical changes happen inside the cell, and then all these shapes that are kind of congregating around the, the tail of the receptor are indicative of protein molecules that are assembling into very specific um, uh, uh, complexes that ultimately lead to more chemistry, more protein-specific complexes, and then a response in the nucleus, usually um, some change in gene transcription that's gonna lead to cell proliferation or differentiation depending on what that original signal was. So this process of information impinging on the outside of a cell and then causing chemical changes and protein-protein interactions inside the cell leading to a cellular response, this is happening in all of our cells all the time. Um, and so this is a general view of that. I'm gonna show you something, a specific, a couple specific signaling pathways. We're not gonna get into the details, but this is how your cells respond to their environment and how changes are induced. Okay, so one more stop um, in the next decade, 1970s, before we really get to learn how cyclopamine works. And that is, there was a group of researchers who were geneticists who were working on figuring out exactly which genes controlled embryonic development. And they're working with fruit flies. And this is, uh, their names are here on the left. Um, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for this work in 1995 for figuring out exactly the roadmap of genetic processes that occur in a developing fruit fly. It turns out mammals and fruit flies are really similar, and so all of this information is super useful as we think about mammalian development as well. And remember those baby lambs were developing when the mother was eating the corn lily. So this work um, set the stage for really knowing precisely which proteins inside the developing embryonic cells are responsible for different stages of development. One of those genes um, they found gave a very unusual phenotype uh, in the fruit fly on the left. You can see these spikes. Geneticists have a great time naming things. They thought that looked like a hedgehog, so they named it the hedgehog gene. Um, and uh, it turns out that cyclopamine targets the hedgehog pathway. Um, and so we're gonna look a little bit more specifically at that. Um, but this was one of a list of um, somewhere between 30 and 50 genes that these original researchers in the 70s had um, identified. So this is the hedgehog pathway. I'm not gonna go into any detail, but you can see the theme. The HH at the top is hedgehog protein. It initiates the signaling by interacting with the extra, the receptors on the surface. Then all sorts of changes happen inside the cell and that gives the um, cell instructions on what to do and how to respond to that original hedgehog single, signal. 
So in normal um, development, this hedgehog signaling pathway is really important for faint, uh, uh, craniofacial development. So the separation of the two lobes of the brain and obviously our eyes separating. Um, and so it's really important in a developing embryo that this cellular signaling process is completely intact. And so it wasn't until 2002 that James Chen and Phil Beachy put this all together and realized that cyclopamine, which is in those corn lilies being eaten by the pregnant ewes, is interfering with the hedgehog signaling pathway. And so uh, these lambs were born with this cyclops look and, and their brains were not properly developed. And so I want to just stress the decades of work from different fields and from different angles, from people not even knowing what the next person was doing and how it all leads to this final understanding. But this isn't cancer. So where, why am I talking about this? So it turns out that in healthy adults, the hedgehog signaling pathway is completely turned off. It's silenced. Um, and that makes sense from what the Idaho ranchers observed. They saw that uh, the mothers were totally fine, even though they were eating the cyclopamine-laced corn lily. Um, and so it turns out that in a number of different cancers, um, physicians and scientists are learning that reactivation of this hedgehog pathway your genes are all there in your cells from when you were a developing embryo. Reactivation of that pathway is the driver of several different types of cancer. So that's interesting and gives us an opportunity for drug development because we know that cyclopamine interferes with this pathway. So can we leap from there and devise ways to interfere with the hedgehog pathway in the case of someone who has a cancer that's driven by reactivation of hedgehog. Um, and so that's been done. Um, here, this was uh, FDA approved this drug that was made by Genentech in 2012. Um, it's called Aravedg, and it's for specific role cell signaling are called kinases. Um, these are enzymes. You all have 538 protein kinases expressed in the various cells of your body. Um, we know what they all are, we know what they all look like. Um, and they all do one type of chemistry. They transfer a phosphate group, which is P on the um, periodic table, onto uh, another protein. And so um, this is kind of the currency of signal transduction. Um, I have here the red arrow on the left pointing at that PY. That sort of initiates the signal transduction pathway and it carries it on. Kinases are the second largest class of proteins targeted by the pharmaceutical uh, companies today with small molecules. Um, the other class for those interested are the G protein coupled receptors. So kinases are a big deal in the pharmaceutical industry and the more we can specifically target one kinase that's causing a problem in cancer, the better off we're gonna be treating that cancer. So this is um, a close up of a cancer drug in what we call the active site of the kinase. So the kinase structure is on the left. This is how we kind of visualize protein structures. We could talk about that for, my students are subjected to that for lectures and we won't do that tonight, but um, and in the yellow block box is where the drug molecule is nestled into this cavity, which I've blown up to show you on the right. Um, and this drug will bind into this active site and it'll stay there. And it'll prevent that kinase enzyme from doing its job in the cell, which will prevent that cell from growing and dividing, which is exactly what we want with a cancer drug. Whoops. So in 2001 was the first time that a specific small molecule drug was developed to target a kinase in cancer. It made the cover of Time Magazine, which some of us remember Time Magazine. I'm not sure anyone gets Time Magazine delivered to their door anymore. Um, so this was called Gleevec, um, and it was a real a blockbuster moment when it was shown that you could successfully target one of the 538 kinases in your body and shut down that particular one for good effect in treating cancer and stopping cell growth. So these types of kinase inhibitors, I like to think of them as powerful but also gentle. Powerful because they can stop a kinase in its tracks, which stops that cell signaling pathway, but gentle because they're very targeted to a very specific kinase and can leave the rest of them alone for the most part. 
So I want to spend a couple of slides giving you a sense of what we do here at Iowa State. Um, and we focus on a very particular kinase, um, which Dean Schmidtman mentioned, Bruton's tyrosine kinase. And it is part of your immune system. So immune cancers are leukemias and lymphomas. Um, where white blood cells are growing out of control. Maybe there's too many of them. There's lots of different types of B-cell malignancies or immune cell malignancies. And so we're interested in this particular kinase because it turns out to be a really good drug target for a lot of these different lymphomas, and I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute. So Bruton's tyrosine kinase was named for Dr. Ogden Bruton. He was a pediatrician working at Walter Reed in the 50s. And he was the first to um, describe a human primary immunodeficiency in a young patient, a boy who was nine, who was getting, um, he was, um, getting uh, recurrent infections. And Dr. Bruton realized that this child had no circulating antibodies. And he didn't know exactly why, but he could measure that this child did not basically have a functioning immune response. Maybe you've seen the movie with John Travolta, The Boy in the Bubble. Yes, no. Watch it. It's on, I think it's on YouTube. Nobody's seen that? Yeah, yeah. okay. John Travolta. Okay, so anyway, it's the same sort of thing. You just don't have an immune system. You're not going to be able to fight off all the pathogens that are coming at us all the time, all day. And so... Um, at the time, in the 50s, Bruton didn't know the, the molecular mechanism for this disease, but he recognized that there were no functional B cells because there were no antibodies. And B cells are the specific white blood cell that make antibodies. So when we get vaccinations, like all the COVID vaccines that we've been getting, that's ultimately ending up activating your B cells to make antibodies so that if you were to get an infection, antibodies that already recognize the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein are going to be present. So if you have no antibodies, it's a problem. And then, uh, several, again, several decades later, in 1993, um, the actual genetic defect in patients with this immunodeficiency was identified, and it's um, genetic alterations in the gene that codes for this BTK protein. So it was named in 1993 Bruton's tyrosine kinase in recognition of the fact that he was really the one that recognized this, this process that the BTK protein is driving through a specific signaling pathway. There's the signaling pathway. I'm not going to go through it in any sort of detail, but the movie I gave you was very simplified. Even this is simplified. This is your B cell. The arch at the top is the cell membrane. The receptors are on your B cell. They're recognizing foreign things like a viral infection, and that triggers all those colored blobs that are proteins to rearrange, activate, form complexes, do chemistry, until ultimately the nucleus in that B cell is told we need to fight this infection, make more copies, and make antibodies. Um, so the, B, the signaling pathways can get very complicated, but again, lots and lots of work have, have worked it all out. So um, BTK is an excellent drug target for the following reasons. I don't think I said this super clearly, but it's only made in your B cells basically, B cells and some of its relatives. So let's just say it's only made in your B cells. So all your other cells don't have BTK. And then it's absolutely essential for B cell growth and function. As we saw in Dr. Ogden's patient, he didn't have functioning B cells because he didn't have properly um, made BTK protein. So those two things together make it an excellent drug target because if we can target BTK in the case of lymphoma or leukemia, none of the cells that don't have BTK, which is the majority of your other cells, are going to be affected at all, and that drug is going to go in to your B cells, inhibit or stop BTK's function, and then stop that B cell proliferation, which is the cause of the cancer. And so these are some of the um, things we have to think about when we're thinking about how to target certain cancers. So that's been done. Uh, this drug was approved in 2014. It's called ibrutinib, and the brand name is Imbruvica. There's actually commercials on TV I've seen recently, which I think means it's going off patent. I'm not sure. But, um, and so it's a very effective drug, for, especially for patients with chronic lymphocyte leukemia and mantle cell leukemia. Um, this is the small molecule, and it basically binds to BTK, the very first structure I showed you with the, the thing nestled in, that was ibrutinib. 
And then that causes the B cells to stop dividing and die and the cancer recedes. So great, it seems like we've solved that problem and it is, really is a fantastic drug, but there's a problem. And that is drug resistance. And this is a problem in all areas of cancer therapy because cancer cells, just like everything else in nature, are striving to survive. They're going to change their genetic makeup. They're gonna, they're gonna create ways to do an end run around ibrutinib in this case. Um, and that is happening in up to about 30% of patients. After some time, they become resistant to ibrutinib, and there are no other treatments for these types of cancers after ibrutinib. Um, and so um, the way this works is even if you just have one cell, indicated by the red cell on the left, that is not, it has a version of BTK that still works but doesn't let that drug bind to it, it's going to survive treatment, and over time, it's going to take over the population, and now the drug is useless. And so this is a problem um, for, as I said, quite a few patients that go on to ibrutinib. So in um, me and my team here at Iowa State, this is one of our main focuses, is to study the BTK molecule. This is a big part of it. There's more that I'm not showing here, but this is how we look at protein structures. Um, and we're really interested in, can we find other ways to stop the activity of this protein? The cyan um, molecule is ibrutinib, but maybe we can find other parts of this protein that we can lock down and keep it inhibited or keep it inactive. Um, and we would call these allosteric inhibitors. And ultimately, the idea would be if you have multiple small molecule drugs that can inhibit or stop a cellular process, inhibit BTK, that's when we start thinking about combination therapy. Um, and that's going to make these cancer cells much less likely to be able to attain resistance if you're coming at it from multiple angles. So this is um, one of the main things that we do in my lab here at Iowa State. We use a, a whole suite of biochemical and biophysical tools. Um, and really try to understand first the structure and the mechanisms that this, the natural mechanisms that this protein uses to control its activity. Um, and then we try to see if we can find small molecules that will, will affect its function. So I think about kinases all the time, and maybe you see me driving around town. This is my car. Um, I remember the night I think I was like, I don't know, I just, I like kinases. So I got on the Iowa DOT site, and I could not believe that there was not another person in Iowa who had kinase on their license plate. So I ordered it, and I said to my husband, I can't believe that I'm going to get this. And he said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I'm still kind of amazed that nobody in Iowa has kinase. So a lot of people think it says kinase. It does not. <laughs> it's kinase. ASE tells you it's an enzyme. Okay. The last story. Now we want to, we've been talking a little bit about the immune response in the context of B cells and BTK and uh, B cell lymphomas, but now I want to sort of switch gears and think about the healthy immune system. How can we, our immune system is amazing. We're going to talk a little bit about how it works. How can we make it work for us in the context of cancer? How can we turn our immune system to recognize cancer as it would a bacterial infection, say, and obliterate it. And so that's really the goal, and I'm going to hopefully tell you some of the progress that's being made in the field in that arena. Okay, so the challenge in, for your immune system is to discriminate between self and non-self. During development, fetal development, you have a whole bunch of immune cells, and they are auditioning. They're auditioning for a part in the final baby that's born. If a particular immune cell reacts with self tissue, recognizes molecules of you, it's gotten rid of. It doesn't get through the audition. It's cut. So only the immune cells that you're born with are the ones that show no preference, no recognition, no sticking to, no binding to molecules of you, and I ideally. And most of the time that works. Um, and so our immune system is really good at that stage of differentiating between self and non-self. And so when an immune cell is circulating and it sees a self, um, another molecule that's part of you, and I'm just calling that a self marker, that's another cell and it has markers on it that says, hey, I'm one of you and your immune cells recognize that and go away. 
But if you have an invading pathogen that has unique markers that it doesn't recognize itself, that's when that immune cell gets activated. And then it'll mount an immune response and, because you have an infection. And so in this movie, I want to show you, um, this is not new, this is old data published by somebody else, the reference is there. Um, what they've done is they've put a dye molecule, a color molecule, into an immune cell, that's the purple, and the cell in the upper right that's not colored is, has some foreign molecules on it. And this immune cell, you're going to see first the kind of the surveillance process, and then you're going to see this immune cell bind to that other cell and get activated. And that's indicated by a color change. And it's just fun to watch. So you can think about this. If you had COVID and that virus was circulating, your immune cells were doing this in the days before you even knew you were sick in order to mount that immune response to begin to battle that infection. And the process of activation, this, this linking of these two cells and then the, the color change, the process of the recognition on the outside is mediated by proteins on the cell surface. As I told you, cells are covered with proteins. Your immune cells have proteins on the outside and as do the other either invading pathogens, viruses have proteins on the outside or just an infected cell. And so it's like a handshake where that, when that handshake is made, that's the signaling initiation. The color change you saw was inside the cell, so that's the cell signaling process starting. And that's telling that particular immune cell that it needs to be activated, proliferate in order to fight that infection. So the problem with cancer is cancer cells are our cells. And so they're not easily recognized by our immune system because remember our immune system is audition cells that don't recognize us. So it's gonna look at a cancer cell and it's gonna think it's us. Um, there are some differences. So the normal cell on the left has this self marker. Cancer cells have those too. Um, but cancer cells tend to produce a lot of extra surface markers. Some of those are will be recognized by our immune system. That's the sort of pentagon shape at the top. That's like a cancer marker. We'd call that a tumor antigen. That is gonna trigger the immune response. But the problem is that other things that that cancer cell is putting out um, are extra copies of things that are on our normal cells. And in particular, this is a particular one protein, and it's called PDL1. This field has a lot of alphabet soup. It doesn't really matter what its name is. But Cancer cells tend to make lots and lots of copies of PDL1. And so what does PDL1 do? It basically is, its only job is to suppress the immune response. So there are cases where you would need to suppress the immune response during pregnancy, and so normal cells have PDL1 as well, um, but cancer cells tend to make tons of copies of it on their surface. And so what happens then is the, um, PDL1 meets the immune cell, that handshake is made, and the minute that handshake is made, it turns off the immune cell. So that's a problem. And so a strategy then for targeting cancer cells would be to block that PDL1 mediated interaction. Can we stop that? And if we can, that would unleash the immune response to go after those cancer cells. And so that's exactly what scientists in the field have done. They have um, produced this drug called Keytruda. Um, it's a drug that blocks the PDL1 handshake with the immune cell. Um, it's only done in people whose cancers show large, high numbers of PDL1 on their tumor cells. So, first, you have to have your tumor checked. If you have high PDL1, you get this drug, which blocks that, and now you've unleashed the immune response. So, I'm gonna actually show it. Let's, let's see if this works. This might not. I think I lost my internet. Okay, there's tons of ads on TV. That's just another, that's one of them. But what that ad shows you is that um, it's an ad for this Keytruda drug, which I'm gonna back up, I'm sorry about my, um, this drug. And this is a immune checkpoint inhibitor is what it's called. And so basically in the ad, the woman says she was diagnosed with this cancer, but she had high levels of PDL1. And she talks about this in the ad. So if you pay attention to these ads, they're actually talking about all these molecules that are really quite important for the mechanisms. 
So once this drug is administered, it will block PDL1 and it will basically license your immune cells when they've recognized the tumor antigen to unleash their power and destroy that tumor cell. Um, so that's, it's a really, really important, rather new um, approach to revving up the immune response in the context of specific cancers that produce high levels of PDL1, and many cancers do that. So it's got broad applicability. Okay, so then the um, last part that I'd like to um, bring up here is, can we vaccinate against cancer? Um, and of course, vaccines have taken on an outsized role in our lives these days, um, but there's several ways to think about vaccinations against cancer. So one is, um, it, I mentioned early on, there's many viral infections that will lead to a higher risk of cancer later in life. And so if we can reduce that viral, and the chance of getting that viral infection early in life, you reduce that cancer risk later. That's pretty straightforward. This is how we think about vaccines, that we're going to reduce a viral infection. And that's the most common one, and I think this one's in the news a lot, is the human papilloma virus. And there's a vaccine now for um, children to um, prevent that infection, um, to, and, the, and the real reason is to prevent the higher risk of cancer later in their lives. But what about mRNA vaccines? So these have become quite famous, um, and it turns out that all the mRNA vaccine development that was going on before the COVID pandemic was geared towards cancer vaccines. They had been working on this for decades, so anything you hear that says this is new technology, it's not. It just hadn't been deployed into people yet, but um, it's really very exciting technology, and what I want to show you in this last little bit is how mRNA vaccines are being used to um, help uh, treat cancer. So the intention of an mRNA vaccine is not to prevent cancer, it's to prevent recurrence. So if you have a cancer and you're treated, say with Keytruda, and you shrink that tumor because your immune system has now gotten at that tumor and your cells have been destroyed by your own immune system, or maybe ibrutinib, you know, there's all kinds of different ways to treat cancer. This approach is to add on top of that and prevent recurrence. So how does it work? So we're, I think most people are pretty familiar with the mRNA vaccine that we've all hopefully received. And the idea is mRNA is a little bit of instruction to make a protein. So in the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, that mRNA is coding for, or in, the instructions for the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so that gets, into, that gets made by ourselves, and then um, that sh is shown to the immune system, and we mount an immune response, and hopefully we make B cells that make antibodies to COVID, and then when we get infected, we have lesser illness. But here, what they're doing is taking advantage of all these extra cell markers that I alluded to earlier. So on this tumor cell, I've added a whole bunch more cell markers that are unique to that tumor. And I've shown you uh, four on the left, and the shapes are the proteins that are decorating the outside of that tumor cell. And then the line indicates you can make an mRNA that will, once inside of a human cell, will be made into that protein. So it's very much the same technology that we uh, benefited from with this, um, the pandemic. But instead, they're, they're taking a look at a specific person's specific tumor markers, making specific mRNAs that match that, Putting that together in a cocktail, I think actually the, the one I'm about to show you, I think there's about 30 uh, tumor antigen proteins that are coded for in the vaccine. And so then that vaccine is given, the proteins all get made, and then your immune system sees those proteins, and now you're steering your immune system towards these cancer cells, because you've selected out the non-self part, we know how to push back PDL1, and now we're, we're focusing the immune system on that particular cancer cell through this mRNA technology. So this is brand new. Um, this was originally announced in December, and last week it got officially announced that uh, Moderna has an mRNA vaccine that when used in combination with Keytruda, which is the PDL1 blocker, will reduce the risk of recurrence or death by 44%. That seems like a lot. Um, and so this is so far still in just finishing phase two trials. It'll go into phase three trials. 
Um, this is a, a shot I took earlier this week. You know, this is like news this week that this mRNA vaccine is working when combined with the Keytruda um, uh, treatment. And so I think this is really super exciting, and we're really just at the beginning of where this is going to go in terms of how we can use this technology to make, you know, personalized vaccines for different cancers. And I mentioned the, the phase three trials beginning this summer for this mRNA, and it's still going to take several years um, for this to uh, be completely approved. So it's not FDA approved yet, but there's also going to be a lot more of these types of of um, mRNA vaccines developed in the future, I'm sure. So looking back at what we've talked about, I'm hoping that you have a sense of time and how, how rapidly we're learning so much more about the molecular mechanisms that control cell behavior, how the proteins within cells and on cells are controlling interactions and, and when things go wrong in cancer, we can use what we know about protein molecules and target those molecules to stop cell signaling. Um, here, uh, I'm going back to when it was just surgical treatment, um, and then in the early 1900s, there was a lot of chemotherapy being used, kind of brutal, not gentle treatments. Um, and then in the 80s and since, there's more targeted therapies, these kinase inhibitors, um, and then in the 2010s, checkpoint inhibitors are these PDL1 blockers. Um, that's really, I think, for the first time, opened up uh, how, you know, how we can turn our own immune system onto cancer. And then, of course, mRNA vaccines are, are coming in the future. So with that, I want to thank my team of researchers and students here at Iowa State. I have, I have the huge pleasure to work with wonderful students here, and I have since I arrived here in 1997. This is my current group. Um, Dr. Raji Joseph on the far left has been in my group for many, many years. She's probably the world's expert on BTK kinase. She knows a lot more than I do, but that's, that's good. Um, my other senior scientist is Dr. David Lin in the middle. He's joined more recently, but he's bringing some very new and exciting technologies to our lab, and we're getting to do things with techniques we've never been able to do before because of his work. And then Jaquise Lowe, Lauren Kiefer, and Rose Perkson are my three current graduate students. But you'll notice that Lauren is Dr. Lauren Kiefer because she defended her PhD thesis on Tuesday this week. So um, that's a very exciting thing, and this is the first time I've been able to use that title in public. And then I would like to thank, um, we're very uh, generously funded by the National Institutes of Health. One thing I should say is that it is said that if academic and federally funded research stopped today, the pharmaceutical companies would have nothing to do in 10 years. And I hope that as I showed you these stories, you could see how basic research along the way is propelling these treatments forward. So it's super important that we continue to do basic research. The College of Liberal Arts and Sciences has been my home since I came here to Iowa State and has provided support in numerous ways over the years. And then, of course, the Roy J. Carver Trust. And the last thing is I know Dr. Sh um, Dean Schmidtman has announced her retirement. And when she did so, she said that she was going to Western North Carolina to hike the mountains, which I think sounds lovely. So I asked AI to draw a picture, paint a picture, in the Impressionist style of Dean Schmidtman hiking the mountains in Western North Carolina with her cat. And this is what I got. And so I'll send that to you and you can put it on the wall of your new home. <laughs> so I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. And the floor is open for questions. And would you please use the microphones at both sides of the room when you ask your questions? <laughs> Thanks, Amy. So you mentioned the bubble boy, and you mentioned the immune system and cancer. And I think we're starting to get a sense that the, the, a routine role of our immune system is to suppress cancer. And we probably don't even know how much that happens. So how much does that happen? What, what does research say about that oh, now? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I always tell my students it's okay to say I don't know. Don't make something up. I honestly don't know. I think, 
I think another big, so there's lots of ways that our bodies suppress cancer before the immune system even needs to get involved. We have lots of proteins in our cells that are called tumor suppressors. They are detecting when things have gone so bad and they basically send that cell into apoptosis, cell program cell death. So that's gonna happen way before the immune system gets involved. We also have ways of fixing DNA damage, which is another way to prevent cancer. So, um, it, it, that's a really good question, and I have to look it up. So, and what I do in my classes, I, I go to Google and I look it up, but I don't have internet here because my movies didn't show my commercial. <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate all the emphasis you put on vaccines. And my concern is those folks who don't believe in the, in the value of vaccine and are campaigning strenuously against vaccinations for children and others. Yeah. What else can we do? I think they're scared of the wrong thing. <laughs> they need to be worried about the disease. Yeah, it's a problem, and I don't have an answer to that other than education. I think education is the key, but thank you for that. Any other questions? I really enjoyed your talking. It was super interesting, but you showed how we moved to all these newer types of drugs. So. Uh, some of the newer drugs and the vaccines are targeting sort of somewhat normal uh, cellular processes. So how do they deal with side effects? Yeah, so there's always side effects because nothing is black and white in biology. And so one of the, um, so this ibrutinib drug, for instance, um, has side effects from off target. So I kind of oversimplified it when I said it only hits BTK. There's a few other kinases that it hits, and those are going to cause side effects. So uh, there's second generation BTK inhibitors, which have now been approved by the FDA in more recent years. And so I think the, the drug companies, they get something that works, they deploy it, and then you see in a population how well it works, what the side effects are, and that motivates de further development of in, in that drug pipeline to more specific uh, or inhibitors that don't cause the same kinds of resistance or completely, you know, combination therapies. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if you have an aggressive cancer, you're probably going to, the side effects can be uncomfortable, but the cancer is going to kill you. It's, you know, so it, you, it's sort of a toss up. But I, I think there's definitely a progression of these um, drug products as they learn more about side effects and how to ameliorate them. Amy, uh, thanks for the uh, inspiring talk. So I have kind of two questions. First is, uh, how do you control PDL1 blocker so the immune system doesn't become too active? So, right, because yeah. PDL1 were, I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. So how, 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 yeah, I think it's a titration. <laughs> okay, right. Um, so, so the, the antibody, the PDL1 blocker actually binds to PD-1 okay. on your immune cells. It doesn't bind the target on the tumor cell. So it's binding your immune cells. Um, and so it's not blocking PDL1 directly. So that's one thing. But it's a really good question and it's a concern. And I have seen um, proposals not survive because people are worried about that. But it's, it seems to be working. And I, have a, I think it's a question of titration. Um, these drugs don't last forever in your, in, your, um, in your serum, and so if you have a certain serum half-life and you can sort of suppress the immune system for some portion of time, you know, then if there's an infection, there's going to be some portion of time when um, your immune system can be active. So I think it's, I think it's a balance, uh, um, and it, it's probably, I think a lot of people were worried about that risk, but it's, 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 okay. yeah. It's in, the, it's in people, so. Yeah, makes sense. And this is the kind of thing I think our FDA is super good at, at figuring out ahead of time before it goes into people whether that's going to be a problem. Um, but on any of these drugs that are altering your immune system, you are also an immunosuppressed person. So you'd be wearing a mask if you were here tonight, you know. So whether it's ibrutinib or PL1 blocker, you're going to be, you're going to have less of a robust immune system than if you were not on those medications. So the second question, actually, you said the combination of PDL1 blocker and the mRNA uh, vaccine actually become more effective. So what's the mechanism behind that? So the mechanism is that the vaccine is producing tumor antigens that 
are, so this is personalized medicine. So I am the patient, my tumor cells will be studied and they will know exactly what tumor markers are on my tumor that are not on my normal cells. And from that information, they will make mRNAs that code for those proteins. And then that's the, that's the cocktail of the mRNA vaccine so that your body, when given that vaccine, will make all those tumor markers, just like it makes the spike protein for SARS. Mm -hmm. And those tumor marker proteins floating around or in your cells will trigger an immune response so that you will then have circulating antibodies that will recognize those specific markers on your particular tumor cell. And so now what you have is you have two ways to get at that, at that uh, to kill that cancer cell. You have the PDL1 blocker, which means anytime an immune cell approaches, it's not going to be immediately turned off. But the immune cells are going to approach that cancer cell more frequently now and not other things because it's been taught to recognize the tumor marker antigens by that mRNA vaccine. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Amy Greek, talk. Uh, question for me when you talk about the personalized therapy yeah. is, is there an interplay or some function? Could this complement the current CART uh, therapy where they, yeah. I think they extract immune cells yeah. and then enrich for the ones that yeah, are so there's attacking. two. So you're bringing up one of two major um, other ways that we're tweaking our immune systems to treat cancer, which I just didn't feel like I had time to get into. One is CAR T cell therapy, which you mentioned, and the other is antibody drug conjugates. So CAR T cell therapy, T cells are another part of your immune system. We've been talking about B cells. CAR T cell therapy, you, it's very much like this mRNA vaccine, but it's a little more complicated and it's very, very expensive. So I don't know how much it's really gonna impact the population. But what's done in that case, as you said, is you take your, the immune cells out of the patient, you redesign the cellular receptors to match the tumor, and then you put those cells back in. And so my humble opinion on that is I think the mRNA, mRNA vaccine is going to be much more efficient and much cheaper to, uh, you know, doing personalized medicine is very expensive, and having to do all that cell engineering is very, very costly. So I think we've learned a lot from CAR T cells, and they may continue to be useful in some cases. I'm not sure about combining them with mRNA vaccines. It's possible. I haven't read anything about that. And then the other um, antibody drug conjugate is, um, uh, this was a, there was a story on NPR recently about this where, so antibodies will bind to, um, very specifically, so you're, you're creating antibodies when you activate your immune system, but if you can attach a drug to an antibody, then you can bring that payload directly to the cancer cell. And that's another type of therapy that's, that's getting good effects. Um, it's kind of combining the small molecule drug with the immune response. So there's a lot, I'm glad you asked that question because it gives me the opportunity to say, I'm not covering everything here. There's lots of ways that people are figuring out how to improve our ability to treat these types of diseases. Uh, yes. First of all, I want to say I'm not anti-science. I'm not anti-vaccine. I had a tetanus shot somewhat recently. I have multiple degrees in science, mm -hmm. multiple majors, mm -hmm. um, but there's always Science is about learning, mm -hmm. trying to find the truth. Um, I recently found out that since the 1950s, we've harvested and utilized um, immortal cell lines from a woman who had uterine cancer. She did not give her permission to have those cells removed, yeah. and they've been used to a large degree in vaccine development. Yep. And I'm wondering if maybe we've had an explosion in cancers in young kids and adults in recent decades, maybe because our immune systems is being suppressed somehow because of this use of immortal cell lines. Um, and I also wanted to mention, I have a niece, I had a niece, who was a nurse here mm -hmm. in Story County, early 40s, young and healthy. She got the COVID shots, she got the booster, then last February she died from COVID. Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry to hear that. And that was part of the reason that I started this by saying we've all lost someone to horrible diseases or accidents, and I understand that, and it's horrible. And um, so let me back up to your immortal cell line question. Um, I believe you're speaking about uh, HeLa cells. 
and that's a fantastic story. There's a book, The Mortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, that tells the story that you're referring to, if anyone's not familiar with it. Um, to my knowledge, those immortal cells are never injected into people. They're used as a vehicle to make the vaccine. They're not part of what is ultimately vac a vaccination. Moreover, I think this is something that's been lost in the public discourse. The mRNA vaccines are really, really clean. There's no eggs, there's no cell lines. It's a, it's a material that looks very much natural material that's made and used as a vaccine. So I think part of the problem with vaccines, I think that you didn't mention this, is allergies. And so this mRNA approach really might get us around that allergy response. That's a problem for many people. So, so yeah, the, I live every day knowing that I don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow and I'm terribly sorry about your niece and I think COVID killed way more people than it should have. Um, and I think the, that we don't know the answers when these things happen, but I do think that as we learn, we can apply science to solve these sorts of problems so the next person that comes along may have a longer time to live. So um, again, I thank you for that comment and I'm very sorry about her. Other questions? You mentioned the FDA, the, I am, I'm, don't know much about it, but can you just in a summary statement uh, talk about how the FDA impacts your research or just research in general and it specifically kind of with the U.S. or internationally, are there other organizations that countries have that impact mm -hmm. the whole development and research efforts? Yeah, so, um, so there's several federal governing body. So the FDA does not affect basic research that I do here or that any of our faculty, many of our faculty do here. That is an arm of the government that, you know, with these, this mRNA vaccine, these trials, the FDA is the supervisory unit that oversees the results, studies the data, and makes a decision uh, whether to allow that product to go into the clinic. Um, so that's very much a part of the government that's concerned about sort of the end product. When drugs or pharmaceuticals get to a point where they're ready, then the FDA has the final say. And it's very, very important. In fact, um, we, I don't know where my co-teacher is, but we teach a class uh, for undergraduates here that's based a lot on, the, well, I didn't get to show my commercial, but we, we talk a lot about all the different drugs that are advertised on TV, which is a strange thing that we're advertising drugs on TV. That's another subject. But part of what we help these students understand is just where the FDA does good. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the thalidomide um, uh, um, problem that happened decades ago. That drug, that caused severe birth defects. It was a drug used for morning sickness. It was used in Europe, caused severe, severe birth defects. And there was one woman at the FDA who never allowed that to be approved here. And I think the FDA is full of outstanding scientists who are really, really good at studying that data. Now, there's been some stories lately of, of interesting things at the FDA, but that's a kind of an offline conversation. But I will jump over to another federal agency, and that's the National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation, USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. These are the entities that, that fund the research that we do in an academic setting. And I think, um, so this is tax dollars, and they're funding basic research, which as I mentioned, if that dried up, the pharmaceutical industry would have nothing to do in 10 years. It's also training the next generation of scientists. My students are funded by NIH funds. Um, and so I think it's a great investment of public funds to create this body of knowledge that then the pharmaceutical companies who have the means to actually make drugs that can go into clinical trials, we don't have that ability here at a university. Um, they can take that knowledge, which has been generated in thousands and thousands of research laboratories in this country and around the world, um, and build on that to make the medicines that the taxpayer then benefits from. Um, so, you know, I think it's a very nice um, system we have, and I hope, you know, It'll, it'll keep going. So, so thank you for that question. It's, the government plays an important role in all of this. So that's probably a great point to wrap up. Uh, please join me in thanking, <laughs> thanking Amy again for this uh, very informative and very exciting lecture. Thank you, Amy.
And if you would like to hang out a little bit more, we have a little reception set up at the back so you can explore some more and ask Amy additional questions. And if you find this really interesting and you want to hear more about research that happens in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and other news, please check out our website at las.iastate.edu. Once again, thank you so much for coming, and I hope you enjoyed tonight's lecture. Thank you.